So this is the is that a title for this paper? Okay, more exam paper one. And it is paper one, it is supposed to be easier. Okay. Question two. We have a box and whisker diagram. Find a percentage of match boxes that contain less than 50 matches. Now, your box and whisker diagrams, they tell you, they give you information. This is 50, 51, 53, and 54. And over here, 47. Can you tell me what these numbers represent? What, what is this for? What is this 47? You link? Yeah, the lower, smallest. What about this one? Highest. What is? Median. And we know that this is the middle position, right? Okay, but 51 is the median value. The position is indicated by this line. Okay, what about this one? 53 is the upper quartile. Okay, and that means that what, what does your upper quarter tell you? Three quarters of the entire thing, which tells me that this is 75%. Okay? So how much is this? 25%. What is this value over here then? This is the lower quartile. And the position is one quarter of the number of respondents. Okay? Or in this case, the number of uh, match boxes. So over here, we have 25%. 25% have between 47 and 50 matches. Another 25% have between 50 and 51. Another 25% between 51 and 53. Another 25% between 53 and 54. Understand how this works now? Okay, so what's my answer? Okay, next. Question four. You got the paper. Okay. Hang on, huh? Okay, next. We have question four. A train that is 138 meters long passes through the MRT station, which is 0.3 kilometers long without stopping. Then they give you the average speed of the train, calculate the time taken for the train to completely pass through. Now, listen. For this question, are they just asking you about the time taken for the train to cover 0.3 kilometers? What else must we include? Yeah, the length of the train. Now, if the train, if I replace the train with one person, and let's just assume that this person, uh, he has a negligible length, okay? Negligible as compared to the MRT station. Uh. And then he goes from one end to the other end. So he is covering 300, uh, 0 0.3 kilometers, right? However, now we have a train that, is, that has a length of 138 meters. So the whole train, wait, let, let me draw the platform, uh. So let's say this is the platform. Then I have the train that is approaching. This train is 138 meters. So with the headlights over here. Okay, then this one is over here we have 300 meters. The time for the train to pass starts from over here time equals to zero then it starts to move, 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 move when it reaches this region over here 138 meters and with the headlight what distance has the front of the train covered the front covered 300 meters but has the train passed entirely already not yet we need to consider another part over here so this is another 138 meters where the, the back side of the train passes through the front region. So total distance traveled, what will it be? 
Okay, total distance will therefore be equals to 300 meters plus 138 meters. That will be 438 meters. Okay, and if we want the if you want the time when you're given a speed, DST, you want the time, so distance divided by speed will give the answer. Time equals to 438 over the speed, which is Yeah, but I can choose to find out the time in terms of hour first, right? Right now, I have converted my 80 kilometers to 80,000 meters. So this gives me 0 0.005475. What are the units? Hours, okay. This is the exact value. Huh? Now, I am ready to convert hours to, what do they want? Seconds. So, which is equals to 0 0.005475 times 3600. That is 19.71, approximately 20 seconds. Yes. Say again. Yes, you are, as long as it is more than one mark, you are going, there will be method marks allocated to it. When I mark, I didn't care. You either get wrong or right. Okay? So, I know you are interested in tabulating your results, see how much you got. It is not going to be very accurate because I'm, I'm not going to spend so much time looking at your all your methods. But I want you to know that if you tally it up, your final uh, value that you're supposed to get is going to be plus minus. Lah, okay? So don't be too fixated on that. Generally, get an idea of how you have performed for this paper. Okay? Now, question five. Very surprising, and I'm quite upset for this question. Simplify. Quite a number of you cannot do it. Yeah, how do you all get this kind of question wrong? I tell you why. It's because of this minus sign. Oh, that is worse. Okay, when we want to test you on this, we like to put these two negative signs, these two in red. Because, look at the screen, shooting. We like to give you questions like this, where there are two negative signs, one over here and one in the fraction. So what students tend to do is, they somehow just attach this negative sign to the 2x, and they forget about this negative 3, when in fact the negative over here should be multiplied to the negative 3 to, to get positive 3. So that is where you always forget. Okay, doing it step by step, just to simplify, we will get, expand the top first, 2x plus 4 over 3 minus 2x minus 3 over 4. Now we want them to have the same denominator. The lowest common multiple will have to be 12. Okay, yes. So I'm going to multiply 4 on both sides, top and bottom for my left fraction. I'm going to multiply 3 for top and bottom for my right fraction. So I, if you are very unsure, very careless, you can do this in pencil times 4. Then this one times 4. Then over here, times 3, this one times 3. Okay. Then we will get 8x plus 16 over 12 minus 6x minus 9 over 12. I still have these two minus signs, which is the trap that we are setting for students. I combine them into one fraction. Copy down the left one, 8x plus 16 minus the entire one, 6x minus 9. Okay? The minus sign over here belongs to the entire numerator, which I am trying to highlight with the use of these red brackets. And finally, we will get 2x, 16 plus 9, that's 25. 2x plus 25 over 12. 
Okay, do your corrections. Insert. Which question are you talking about? Why would you have three six feet? It is exact. No, it is. If it is exact, you leave it as exact. Why isn't it? The lower quartile is the bottom twenty five percent. There is no calculation involved in that question. Three B. Okay, three B. If the answer is exact, you leave it as twelve point two five. Was the answer exact? Are then? No, you only go to three six B if you have many many numbers. When you have recurring, uh, what else is that? When you have recurring or you have what's that? Irrational. What do you mean three DB? If they are exactly three DB, is it? They put three DB down, ah. Four. Okay, then angle is another thing. Oh, you asking about angle, is it? Yeah lah. Okay. Any other questions? If it is five DB, just put down, ah. Okay, moving on. Yes. Yes. Question seven A. But this one you all do until very headache, right? Seven A. <laughs> I don't know what very wrong with yours. Okay, based on the question, ah, uh, twelve minutes for. Twenty thousand spectators with twenty exits. Okay, then now they want twenty thousand spectators with T exits. Okay, this is what they want in the end, uh, the blue color one. Let me just uh, shift down. Hey, hey, why you all look so swaku? Ah? Okay, so we want the time taken for 20,000 people to exit with T exits. So T is the question mark. So what, we, what you can do is to find out hey, how much time is required for 20,000 spectators with just one exit. Okay, let's consider this. There are, three, there are three things we have to consider, but we can choose to consider just two things at one time. In this case, I'm keeping the spectators constant. I'm just seeing how the time varies with the number of exits. Okay, now, uh, with 20 exits, you take 12 minutes. With the same number of people, I shrink it down to one exit. Do you think the time will be more or less? So are we doing a multiply or times? Okay, so what multiply by what? Oh, sorry, are we doing multiply or divide? Multiply lah, okay? So what is the time taken for one exit? So this will be 12 times 20, just to 240 minutes. Okay? Equin, you know how I got 240 minutes? No. Yes, ah? Okay. Then now, there are T exits. T is just a letter representing a number. If you are very uncomfortable with T, let's just consider what if T is now equals to three. For example, if there are three exits, do you take, and then we are comparing this one, two, four, zero minutes for 20,000 spectators with one exit. Now, if there are three exits, do you expect more or less time? Less time lah. So if this is now equals to three, then what the what will, what will the time be? Two four zero over three, right? Agree or not? Now what if this is six exits? Maybe two four zero divided by six, lah, right? 
we get less and less time as the number of doors increase. So now I'm going to change this to T. So what will this be? T law? 240 over T minutes for 20,000 spectators with T exits. How to present? Present like that. Hang on, hang on, I'll come to that. Okay? So this would have been 12 times 20. All right, then part B. Surprisingly, a uh, number of you managed to get the correct answer even though your part A was wrong. Ipin being one of them. Yes, yes, you can. So if you still get part D correct, uh, you'll still get a mark. But if they just say hands, then you have no choice, you have to use it. Okay? Now, part B, they say that time taken to empty the stadium for 36,000 spectators and 24 exits. Okay. The, for 36,000 spectators with how many exits this time? 24. 24. So this is my question mark. Now I'm going to relate this to what I had in my conclusion earlier on. In my earlier conclusion, I say that 240 over T minutes for 20,000 spectators with T exits. So right now, if there are, I'm, I'm still going to keep the number of spectators the same because I don't want to complicate things. I just consider two variables at a time only. Okay? So the time taken will be 240 over 24 minute for 20,000 spectators with 24 exits, right? This sentence that I'm writing is based on our earlier conclusion. I am simply substituting the number of exits with 24, which is what is required in part B. Okay, so this is just 10 minutes. We need 10 minutes to get these 20,000 spectators out using 24 exits. Now, things have changed. In part B, they tell you that, oh, the number of spectators is no longer 20,000. In, in fact, it is going to be 36,000 now. With 24 exits. Okay, so that's the question we need to answer. Since we need 10 minutes to evacuate these 20,000 spectators, do you expect more or less time to evacuate 36,000 spectators with the same number of exits? We expect more. La. So in this case, it is going to be directly proportional. Earlier on, it was a case of inversely proportional. Right now, it is a case of directly proportional. Okay? So, answer? This should be very straightforward. La. Primary school type of question already. Then divided by? Why five? Why you got 40,000 one? Basically, 20,000 people require 10 minutes. 36,000 people require 10 over 20,000 times 36,000 minutes. Well. And that will give you 18 minutes. You can, can let me take a closer look later on to see what happened. Okay, so this is my working. Ken, you are just combining all my steps into one. Now. Yeah, I like to use purple color, Ken. Katik, are you okay? Or? Patek, are you okay? When you, when your, when your pencil case is blocking your eyes, then I get suspicious. You know, can you remove it? Right, the next question I'm going through is question 8A. You're done with this? What? OK, 
Okay, question 8A. Simplify 1 divided by 3x to the power of negative 5. This is a giveaway question, but so many got it wrong. Be clear. What do we have in this expression? 1 divided by... Are we dividing by the whole thing? Or are we dividing by 3 only? Okay, so uh, everybody look at the screen. Is this 1 divided by 3x power negative 5? Or 1 divided by 3 times x power negative 5 this way? Which one is it? Left or right? Left or right? Left. Left. It is the left hand side. So let us not consider this. Okay? So we are dividing by this, right? Yeah, you can choose to take away negative or you can just convert it into a fraction first. Lah. 1 over 3x power negative 5. Yes? Then x power negative 5 is actually 1 over 3 times 1 over x power 5, right? This is the same as 1 over 3 divided by 1 over x power 5, right? This equals to 1 over 3 times... Wait, wait, wait. Times x power 5, right? Are you sure it's the same? Are you sure it's the same? Okay, before we look at this first, uh, do you all agree with my working so far? Okay, because this is, we flip this over, you get x power 5 over 1. Uh. So my answer is x power 5 over 3. Okay, it looks, it looks like very long, but actually from this step, I could have gone here already. This part is not necessary, if you are very familiar with it already. Okay, from here to here. Another question, is it the same as this? This is multiplied by x power negative 5. Over here, I have multiplied by x power 5. So there is a difference. Okay, so this is still wrong. Any questions? Okay, then question 9. A. How much is a giga? Yes, excellent. Wait, what? what? I say that. Okay, no wonder everybody got it wrong. <laughs> no wonder everybody got it wrong. Okay, so then uh, you can rest assured that your concepts are correct if you follow this um, mistake over here. Okay, okay. So if I do it according to um, 1 gigameter equals to 10 to the power 12 meters, I will get the same answer as you. Maybe you need to try Yeah, let's try it. Uh, uh. Yes? Yeah, just just follow whatever they tell you because because if you follow whatever they tell you, right, they cannot fault you, right? Uh, but we of course try not to let that happen, lah. Okay, twelve giga meters. Is equals to twelve. Giga, according to the question, is 12 times 10 to the power of 12 meters. Okay? Then they want to convert it to kilometers. So this will be 12 times 10 to the power of 9 times 10 to the power of 3 meters. It's 12 times 10 to the power of 9 kilometers. Uh, so go ahead and change your... Uh, you, okay, you shouldn't be changing your answer. You should have instead be changing this 10 to the power of 12 to 10 to the power of 9. Okay? Yes? I can't hear you, Chao Hong. Did you say standard form? 
No, they didn't say standard form, so you don't have to, but you can do that. Okay? Yes, yes. Or you can change the giga to... What what it stands about, Tiofa? Huh? Terra, is it? Change the giga to Terra. Okay, then you'll be fine. Yes. Yes, yes. The first number is between 1. It's uh, greater than or equal to 1. And the answer and the upper limit is smaller than 10. They never say standard form. It's just a way of representing the number. Oh, you can choose to write 1, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, you'll still get the answer. Okay, so this is, so x is equals to 12 times 10 to the power of 9, or 1.2 times 10 to the power of 10, or like what you can say? Okay, now part B. Find the speed. It goes to distance over time, right? What's the distance? How do you, what's the distance that it travels? Yeah, you need to find the circumference. It is traveling in a circle. So we need 2 pi times the radius. What is the radius? Oh yeah, okay, okay, we can use pi d. So we can use pi times, what do we have as the diameter? 12 times 10 to the power 9. Yes. Over the time taken, what are the units they want? Huh? Wow. Kilometers per hour. So it took 88 days, right? We need to convert 88 days to hours. 88 times 24. So answer will be... Are you sure not? Oh yeah, yeah. How much? How much? Anjali? Hey, stop it. Anjali. Okay, so this is according to the... This is according to whatever errors that they gave in the question, right? So this will be 1.78 times 10 to about 8. Okay? Or zero. Count the sum up. Okay, next one. Quiet, quiet. Anybody has any questions at this point? Yes, Farisha? Anjali, your answer correct or not? Uh, yeah, you, okay. So one small thing, uh, I'm sure you all know how to press calculator. Whether it's 7 or 8, I can't be bothered to argue. <laughs> Next, 9, no, 10. 10 B, part 2. So 10 A is now you never mark. Oh, never mark. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah, I didn't mark. Okay, what, what you have to shade is this part. Okay, so mark yourself, huh? Then, part B, part 2. Hey, noisy are uh, this class. B, part 2. Almost everybody got this wrong. So watch. B, part 2. I'm not going through B, part 1. B, part 2. They say that, okay, this is your A and B, huh? Then, E, they say that E is, when E intersects A, you get this. What is this? Okay, so in words, huh? E intersecting A is not an empty set. Okay? E intersect A is not an empty set. 
What does that mean? Yeah, that, that means they can intersect. Okay, so what this means is E could be a subset of A. Okay, or it could entirely be inside A. Possible la. Or part of E is in A. Two possibilities la. So such that they do intersect. It's, it's only a matter of is E totally inside A or E or is E part part of E is in part of A. That's the question la. Okay, that's the first statement. Then next statement we have E intersect B is equals to now the now set. What does this tell us? Yeah, E intersect B, you get a now set. Means that this doesn't happen. E does not intersect B. That means it cannot be inside B lah. It cannot touch B at all. Okay. So we now have options, either E is going to be inside here, or E is going to be inside here. Two options, either it's totally inside A, and not touching B, or it is part of A, but not touching B. Okay, two options, huh? so now we need the last key, which is A complement is a subset of E complement. A complement is a subset of E complement, Meaning, if I try to change it in words, A complement is everything outside A, right? Right? A complement is everything outside A. So everything outside A is a subset. Right? See, subset. Everything outside of A is a subset of 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 what? Everything outside E. You agree with this statement so far? Everything outside A is a subset of everything outside E. So which one of these two makes sense? You only have one choice there. La. Only the inner one makes sense. Everything that is outside A, so I'm gonna shit, I'm gonna highlight it now. Huh? Everything that is outside of A. Everything outside A is outside everything that is E. So this, if I say that this is E, then I will get this. Does it make sense? All the yellow is within all the red. So that means I can conclude already. E must be this one. And not the one that is partially in A and partially outside A. Okay? So my answer is E. So you go and put your E inside A but outside B and you don't draw a circle. So if you don't draw a circle then E becomes an element. Then E is no longer a set. So you will get wrong still. You need to show me the letter E as well as a circle inside A but outside B. Can? Hey, question eight. Hey, I thought EP, you got this correct? What is your answer? Uh, three five zero zero. I got three five. Are you sure? Anybody got two one eight seven five zero zero? Okay. Uh, never mind. My answer differs from what is given to me. So let me examine what the, they are proposing first. So let's skip. Let's let's go on to question thirteen first. Okay, thirteen A. Well, twelve B. Most of you got it correct, huh? Oh. 
zero is an integer. Yeah, I'd say zero. So we have negative four over five, x and five. So we only have this region to this region. Sorry? Yes, we can have negative integers. Wait. Negative? Okay, there are negative integers. Okay? So what is the smallest integer over here? Zero. Law. Okay? Yeah, see my negatives are on the left hand side. Ah. Okay, 13A. Look up. Sorry? You want me to go through 11, is it? Can you all tell him what I just said? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Maybe my answer correct. Okay, 13A. Shh. Listen, listen. Part one, we need to find angle... B A D, B A D over here. This angle. Yeah, we are using alternate angles because this is a rhombus. Okay, so this is thirty-two degrees also. Yes, you link got it. This one, since this is a rhombus, which I didn't draw it properly, these two lengths are the same, right? So this is also thirty-two degrees. Yeah, rhombus of all sides are the same, length. But I didn't draw it very accurately. Okay? So, from... To find. So, D, A, B. Working-wise, huh? Angle D, B, A equals to the... D, B, A equals to... Angle B, D, A, which is 32 degrees. Reason, alternate angles. Then tell me which are the parallel lines DC parallel AB. So I have. Hmm? Yes, yes. Then I have the same usual type of question. So one mark only, do I need to write so much? No need. You can just write 32 degrees. But this is, I'm showing you what is expected if it is more than one mark. So you can use this time to practice or you can be lazy and just write 32 and you'll see the difference during your whole levels yeah I haven't finished yet I mean I'm just illustrating okay then since this is 32 angle BAD is equal to 180 degrees minus 32 degrees minus 32 degrees this is angle sum of Oh, no, no, no. I haven't yet, I haven't yet. Okay, this 32, huh? No, there is one more step first. I have this as 32. Then, uh, angle ADB is equal to angle ABD, which is 32 degrees. Reason, base, angles of isosceles triangle. Then finally, we can solve for angle B, A, D. I, S, O, S. So this is 116 degrees. Okay? I, S, O, S. Huh? 
Now, uh, I managed to get this already, which is 116 degrees. And finally, they want angle AGE. A, G, E. Yes? Okay, Yuling is asking about this. And then the Ola. Okay, this is your interior angles. These are your alternate angles. And these are our corresponding angles. Jing is still straight. Yes? Okay, one last one. Uh, to find the blue angle, I will need to know what is angle G, D, B. I want to find out what this angle is first. Because once I manage to find out this angle, this is a parallelogram. Okay, these are parallel lines. G, C, and DB are parallel lines. Once I manage to get this, I'll just take 180 minus the orange one to get a blue one. Okay, so for part two. Angle GDB is equal to 180 degrees minus 32 degrees, which is 148 degrees. Okay, this one we found earlier, this was 32. So the orange one is 148. Reason is ang angles on a straight line, or rather adjacent angles. Angles on a straight line. Why? So once I have this, I can find the blue one already. And that is the answer they want, A, G, E. Is equals to 180 degrees minus angle GDB. These are your interior angles. GC parallel to DB. This is 180 degrees minus 148 degrees. And you get 32 degrees. Yes, Ryan. A, D, B. What, what do you mean? Can you try again? DB parallel to GC, yeah, then? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you could have just said that. Angle ADB equals to angle AGE. This is because they are corresponding angles and GC parallel to DB. Okay, shorter method. Any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to part B. Okay, part B, regular polygon, interior angle X. Do you remember how to find interior angles of a polygon? Yes. What is the sum of angles in a polygon? 180 degree by 10 minus 2 over X. That is for one interior angle that is right of a regular polygon. Right? Yeah, okay. So if you want a total, it will be 180 times N minus 2. If you can remember, you can draw the shape yourself and then go and divide into the number of triangles. Then you'll find that the sum will be N minus 2 times 180 degrees. This is how I divide my triangles. This is how Miss Tan divides her triangles. She starts from the center. Then she finds the sum. And then she finds the center. Then she minus away the center. For me, I just see that, oh, five-sided, right? I can get three triangles. So straight away, I minus two triangles already. Either way, it works. You'll get the same thing. Okay, this is how Miss Tan tells you to remember the, a, the total sum of angles in a polygon, right? You divide from the center out to the number of triangles. Then the number of sides tells you the number of triangles, right? So there are 
five triangles, but we do not want this 360 in the middle, right? So that is why her answer will be 5 times 180 degrees minus 2 times 180 degrees. In other words, this is 5 minus 2 times 180 degrees. That is your formula, n minus 2 times 180 degrees. Lah. My method is I have the same polygon, but instead of dividing into triangles from the center, I choose one point, one point and then I divide into three triangles. If it is a five-sided figure, I will end up with three triangles. If it is a seven-sided figure, I will naturally end up with five triangles. You can go and divide yourself and see it and convince yourself. So I see confused faces. Let me draw something with five sides. No, seven sides. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I'm going to divide now. It's a seven-sided figure. Why? What? What's wrong with this? It's, how is it not seven side? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven side. Lah. I didn't say it's a regular polygon, right? Miss Tanwa also didn't say it's a regular polygon. I'm just finding the sum of the angles. So I divide it into five triangles. So this will be seven minus two times one is zero degrees. And we get the same answer. This is five minus two times 180 degrees. You get the same answer. Huh? Okay, yeah, we spend quite a bit of time on this. All just to answer 13B. It's a regular polygon interior angle X. X is an integer and is obtuse. That means X is more than 90 degrees and it has to be smaller than 180 degrees because you can't have a polygon with an interior angle more than 180 degrees so this part is important also okay then we can apply our formula you all know that it's n minus 2 times 180 degrees divided by n because they are n sides so this is between 90 degrees and 180 degrees go and solve it properly you will end up with n greater than 4. So the least number of sides will be n equals to 5. Before I go to 15a part 2, uh, I still need to talk about 14b. Yeah, 14b. Okay, let's take a look at 14B. Let's look at the cross-sectional area. That means this part. Then draw some vertical lines now. This is 11 cm. A, B, C, and D. The height, 3 cm. And they're asking for the number of cubes 1 cm in length that can be pla placed inside the prism. So obviously over here I can have, well, what was the length over here? Five. This is 5, right? So I can have 1, 2, 3, 4, five. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then another, and one more. Because 3 cm, right? Okay, then the question is, this part, how many can I put? 4. How do you know? Okay, wait, wait, yeah. This one over here is 3 cm, right? Yes. Over here also 3 cm, huh? Yeah. Then, let me just draw some dotted lines. Uh, this is also 3 cm, this is also 3 cm. So the question is, can I fit all three inside here? Cannot. I cannot, right? But how many can I fit? Four. Here I can fit two, can fit one more here. Why 4? 
Why do you take half times three times three? So what if you find the area? You can't fit inside here, ma. This this triangle and this triangle. But are you gonna are you gonna chop your cube? Let's see this again, huh? If I class class class, if I try if I try to draw it to scale, I have three units over here. Okay, this to scale, huh? One cm, one cm, one cm. Over here also one cm, one cm, one cm. Okay, so how many cubes or how many squares of side one by one can I put inside? I only have one square over here. Then one square over here and one last square over here. I only can fit these three squares inside. The others are triangles. I cannot fit anything unless I chop my cubes. So by symmetry, the other side I also will end up with three cubes. Yeah. La. What is it? Huh? No, you don't have to draw. If you want to Yes, you can calculate. Presentation wise. Okay, anyway. Now you know the cross section is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. It's going to be 21 squares times 11. It goes to 2, 3, 1 cubes. Okay? I'm going to extend and just go according to the, the side, which is an, again 11 cm. Okay, presentation wise, how can we do it? We can say number of one by one cm squares in cross section is equals to, let's talk about the easy one first. Over here, five times three. Okay, that's 15. Five times three. Then we add whatever is in the triangle. Over here, three plus three. Three plus three. So that gives me a total of 21 squares. You can choose to draw it out, but according to this marking scheme, you don't need to draw. If you just magically come out with the number 3, they will give it to you. To calculate, I don't know how to calculate. I don't see how you can calculate. They, then you notice they didn't give you a very big triangle. What GL? This is recorded, huh? It's gonna be posted online, huh? Okay, so this is 21 squares, number of cubes. Because so 21 times 11. So 2, 3, 1 cubes. Okay? Yes. Which one? What is it that you want to know about the polygon? The number of sides, is it? Who else haven't copied it? The number of sides for the polygon. So it's just you, la. then you watch the video. Okay? Question 15 now. Express x squared minus 6x plus 2 in the form of, meaning complete the square. La. So this will be x squared minus 6x plus negative 6 over 2 square minus negative 6 over 2 square plus 2. Completing the square. You may know of some shortcuts. If you apply it correctly, good for you. Otherwise, this is the step by step on how to do it. You can use this as a revision. Left hand side is equal to right hand side. Whatever I introduce, I take away as well. So they are equal. Why did I introduce this? Because I need this to complete my square. This is now in the form of a square minus 2ab plus b square. Okay? Then I have x minus 3 square minus negative 3 square plus 2. So x minus 3 square minus 7.
not gonna spend too much time on this, even though I mean you all know where you where you went wrong, lah. Part two, sketch the graph of y equals to x squared minus six x plus two. To sketch this and to include the turning point x intercept blah blah blah, we can we can use our computer square form to find our line of symmetry. Okay, over here. This is equals to x minus 3 squared minus 7. So this tells me that turning point is 3 comma negative 7. Line of symmetry is x equals to 3 based on the x coordinate of the turning point. Yes? Then I need to find the intercepts. Y intercept is when yeah x equals to 0 that means y equals to 2 y intercept when y equals to 0 solve minus b plus minus square root blah 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 and you get the answer of 0 0.354 or 5.65 and we know it is a parabola that is Opening upwards, coefficient of x squared is positive. Label your graph, lah. Write down the equation. So, what? You had other mistakes also. Okay, over here I have drawn, I think, quite a pretty parabola. It is symmetrical about this point x is equals to 3. Okay, quite symmetrical. Huh? Then these values over here, they are meant to be 0 0.354 and 5.65. This is your x and this is your y. Over here, this is 2. This is negative 7. So label your turning point carefully, properly. And label y equals to x squared minus 6x plus 2. Let me show you some exam some non examples of parabola. Okay, let, let's make it more exaggerated. This is not a parabola because these parts are almost straight already. It is supposed to be a curve. Okay, and let me show you another example of a non parabola. Why is this not a parabola? It is not symmetrical. So your parabolas must be symmetrical. Kartik, do you got this correct? Do you get this correct? Okay, next one. Part B. That's until chop thirty, right? Chop thirty lah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, quadratic curve. Find the equation of the curve. Hey, what are the clues they gave you? Huh? X intercept. When they give you the x intercept, it means that the equation of ax squared plus bx plus c equals to 0 has the solution of x equals to negative 1 and 3. Right? The x intercepts are negative 1 and 3. So the solution of this one equals to 0 is negative 1 and 3. In other words, yeah, x plus 1, x minus 3 equals to 0, right? Ah. Then, is this the correct answer? Why not? Say again, Kartik. Surface. Oh, it should be a set face. It says it should, it's a parabola opening downwards. What does that tell you about the coefficient of x squared? Yeah, so you put a negative here. Then the equation will be y equals to negative x plus 1, x minus 3. Or you can leave it in the form of y equals to negative x squared plus 2x plus 3. Ah, oh, yes? Angelique. 
Do you get it correct? No. Sure not. I think only two people got it correctly. Eh? You got it correct. Okay, good. Negative bracket x squared minus 2x minus 3. Then you come to this step, you might as well expand it already. Okay, next. 16c. Sketching of graph. Why? You didn't got it correct, is it? 16b, the answer will be 22, 11 over 30, or 22 point. I don't know. Like that. This answer for b. And the answer for C? I initially accepted based on this marking scheme, but it should not be because you have an exact value. Okay, I'll talk about that. Draw the dotted line. Yeah, yeah, you take it away first. No, no, no. 22 and 11 over 30 because you have an exact value. You mean this is rounded off, man? Yes? Okay, I'll talk about this. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, next one, part C. Class. Uh, what do you remember from physics? Uh, in fact, about from your emails also, about the gradient of your distance time graph. What do you have from the gradient of your distance time graph? Speed, right? Okay. Based on the diagram given to you in question 16, you have a speed time graph, right? Is there any point in time where the speed is undefined? No, right? You have a speed for every single second, every single instant, okay? What that tells you is that the gradient of your speed, of your distance time graph, meaning it's the speed, will be defined. I know some of you are not listening, so I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. Since the speed time graph shows you all the different speed for different timing, it tells you that speed is defined from time equals to zero to time equals to 60, right? It has a speed. Now, we also learned that the gradient of your distance time graph is your speed. So since your speed is defined, then the gradient of your distance time graph must be defined. Agree? Agree? Gradient of distance time graph, which is equal to the speed, must be defined. Meaning it must be available. Okay, there is a value of the gradient. Agree so far? Because we all have we have all the different values for the speed. Okay. How do we find a gradient of a curve? I draw a tangent line. For example, if I want a gradient over here, suppose this is a distance time graph. I want to find a gradient over here, I draw a tangent line. Right? A straight line. Then I draw my triangle and I find the then the gradient and that will give me the speed. What if it is a straight line this time? Very easy lah, your rise over run. What if I give you a distance time graph that looks like this? What is the gradient over here? Zero, easy right? Gradient over here, positive or negative? Positive. What's the gradient here? You see a start, it is neither positive nor zero. Zhang Ho, look at the screen. Brian, look at the screen. Gradient at this point. Can you draw a tangent line? You cannot. It is a point. You cannot draw a tangent line. The gradient at this point is undefined. Let that sink into you. The gradient at this point is undefined. Of course, I cannot draw the gradient, right? Can you draw a gradient at this point? Can you draw the tangent line? You can't. You can't say that the gradient is zero because 
this point belongs to this diagonal as much as it belongs to the flat line. You can't say that the gradient is zero. You can't say that the gradient is, for example, three. It is undefined. So if I see a distance time graph with this kind of sharp points, it tells me that the speed over here is undefined. But you look at your, the graph given to you in the question. Every time, every point in time has a corresponding value of speed. That means I am expecting a smooth graph for my distance time graph. It must be smooth. Okay? So some of you are very confused as to how to draw a smooth graph. I know that at time equals to 15, the speed will be, sorry, the distance is 300. I also know that at time equals to 40, the distance traveled is 990. And finally, it will be 1342 at time equals to 60. Okay, these are the points that I must have in my graph. It is now a matter of joining them up. Which point, which region is a straight line? Uh, the first one, right? 0 to 15 is a straight line. Okay, good. We know that this is a straight line. We start from time 0, 0. Okay, one straight line. What is the speed over here? Can you tell me what's the speed from 0 to 15? 300 over 15. Yes, you name. And that was given in your speed time graph, isn't it? Yeah. So we we just keep doing constant comparison with our speed time graph. Yeah. From time zero to fifteen, your speed is is uh, twenty. So gradient over here, gradient equals to twenty. Okay. Now let's refer to your speed time graph again. When time equals to fifteen. Speed equals to 20. That's from your graph. When time equals to 15.1, is the speed still 20? It has increased a little bit, right? That tells us that the gradient of our distance time graph will increase a little bit. It will get more steep. Okay? So over here, we are expecting a curve slightly going up. Okay, I, I didn't draw it very nicely. Let me, let me change the scale a little bit so that it's more obvious to you. I'm expecting a curve going up. Okay? Then if I were to draw, if I try to find out the gradient from 0 to 15, it is a straight line, it is constant gradient of 20. When I try to draw a tangent line at x at time equals to 15, I will still end up with this straight line the gradient is still defined at time equals to 14, and that is the value of 20. When my time increased by a little bit, for example over here, then I draw a tangent line to find the speed, and I see that, hey, it is steeper now, meaning the speed has increased. That corresponds with my speed time graph, okay, the second region. So I know that it is increasing gradually, and that is why this part must be smooth. The gradient is defined. The gradient gives us the speed. So for those of you who drew it this way, like that, then like that, it is wrong. Because this part, I don't have a gradient. Gradient is undefined. That's why it must be smooth. Next region, from 40 to 60. Our distance is still increasing, although the speed is decreasing. So we are expecting another curve. And this time, it will look like this. Okay. This part. Why does it look like this? Because the gradient again tells us the speed. At this region over here, I draw a tangent line, the gradient is still defined. Because I do have sharp points, it is a smooth curve. So, the speed at this point will be 32.5. Speed equals gradient equals 32, 35.2, I'm sorry. Then the gradient decreases. As shown in your speed time graph, gradient drops. What is the final gradient? I feel that only Yuling is following me. What is the final gradient of this speed of this distance time graph? 
zero. Why do you know it is zero? Yeah, because according to the diagram, in your, in your question, the speed is zero, meaning my gradient must be zero. So this part must be flat when you draw it out. Do you have a flat line over here? Yeah, it is going to have reached a gradient of zero, meaning flat. At the end of time, it goes to 60. Do you have a better idea of why the graph looks like this? We still understand? Okay. All right, the question 17 is quite okay. 17A answer 10.25. Seventeen A, ten point two five, B five point nine one, C mean increases by yes by two minutes. You cannot just say it increases. S D. I'm just writing in short form. No change. Okay, next up. 18. 19, 19. Yeah, 19. 19 more problems. 18, 18C. 19C. 18C. 18C. Okay, I go to 19 first. Quiet turn down. Plus. Look at your 19C. Plus, CD is given to be negative 11 and H. Then, they want A, B, C, D to be a uh, trapezium. Trapezium will have two parallel lines. So A, B, C, D, for example. They must have two parallel lines. These two, A, D, and B, C, they don't have to be the same length. Okay? Now for it to be a trapezium, C, D, we can rewrite it as moving from C to B, then from B to A, then from A to D. Right? It is a route that we can take. CD is given to be negative 11 H, then fill in the rest. Negative 6, negative 4, plus negative 8, and 4, plus A, D. Okay, just substituting only here. Right now, we are trying to, ex we are trying to express A, D in terms of H. Then later on, we will make use of the properties of a, of a trapezium, the parallel lines, to find out the value of H, the possible ones. Okay? Then, simplify it. We will get negative 11 H is equals to negative 14, 0 plus A, D. Therefore, A, D is now 3 H. Simplification only. So in this trapezium, which are your parallel lines? Um, a, D, and B, C are parallel lines. A, D, and B, C, they are parallel lines. If you sketch your trapezium out. So since you know they are parallel, I can express one in terms of the other by a scalar multiple. Okay? So, I will rewrite, I will replace my AD with 3 and H. This is equals to K times of BC, which we already found BC, which is 6, 4. Scalar multiple, because they are parallel lines. Now, is it much easier to solve?
Okay, so from here, 3 is equals to k times 6, therefore k equals to half, then h equals to half times 4, and you get 2. That is one value of h. So you see that there are two possible answers, right? Okay, so this is one answer. We have another possibility. 8 over 11, yes. Okay, but why? It's because instead of just AD parallel to BC, we have other options. We could have, change color, AD parallel to DC. This is the other option. That means I will write 8 and negative 4, which is my AB, is equal to K times of DC, which is 11 negative H. Then solve again, same format, h will be equal to 8 over 11 after you find k. j is equal to 5, okay, let, 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 me, not, let me do it step by step, huh? I don't skip. Huh? So since they are parallel, 8 is equal to 11k, therefore k is equal to what? K is equal to 8 over 11. Ah. Why? 8 equals to K times of 11. K equals to 11 over 8. Then we substitute that into the element at the bottom. Negative 4 equals to 8 over 11 times negative H. Therefore, H e equals to 5.5. So the two values of H are 2 or 5.5. A number of you only managed to get one of these values. So you must know that there are two possible ways to form the trapezium, which will result in two possible answers for H. H no 87.9. That's the answer for 20. The answer for 20 is 87.9. Yeah, very strange. Huh? All of you get such close numbers, but you all don't get the correct answer. Okay. Okay, so this is what we have. This is 10, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and the centers are joined. 7 cm over here, 10 cm. Find the length of the string. Okay. We can, yeah, we can find the circumference of the small circle and the big circle. Right? So what if we find a circumference? We are actually interested in... Is it half circumference? We are only interested in this part of the curve. Everybody look at what I'm drawing because the diagram given in your question may be misleading. You may have thought that... You may have thought that this is actually, instead of slanting this way, you may have thought that it actually is vertical line down. Then you consider only half of the circumference. So your answer is slightly wrong. You know what I'm saying? No? Yeah, no. So this is the main problem you all have for this question. Sixteen point seven three three. No, I don't see that at all. The line connecting the radius of the two circles. Okay, this one 
this blue one and this one is 17 cm. Look at that. Okay, let me think. Huh? I'm thinking. Length of line connecting the radius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but I don't. Do we need that? Yeah, okay. Okay, yes, this is uh, this is equal to square root of, this is uh, 17, huh? 7 and 10. 17 square minus 3 square. This is square root of 280. I don't want to evaluate yet. Then now, this one is also of the same length. This part. Do you agree that this this red part is also the same length? Because they are tangents to a circle. This is also 90 degrees. Same as this. Using the same logic, this will also be square root of 280. Yeah, we are using Pythagoras. Okay, I'm thinking. No. Sine theta is three over seventy. Cosine theta over here is equal to three over seventeen, meaning I can find the value of theta. Theta is equal to inverse cosine three over seventeen. So I get this angle. Then by symmetry, this is also theta. 2 theta equals to 2 times of cosine inverse 3 over 17. Once I get this angle, then I know this angle. Yeah. So once I get this angle, which is actually, let's call this alpha. Alpha is equals to 2 pi minus 2 theta, which is 2 pi minus 2 cosine inverse 3 over 17. This is alpha over here. So the a, the arc length of this yellow part, major arc length, is equals to r theta. Radius is 10 times 2 pi minus 2 cosine inverse 3 over 17. Okay? So this is for the major arc. And we can do the same thing for the smaller arc. No, it is not a math. Okay, this is 90 degrees. Then we already know that this is theta. This is also 90 degrees. Then I can find this angle. Hey, what are you looking at? Okay, try to focus. Huh? Since we already found the angle theta, and I know that this is a right angle triangle, I can also find this little angle over here. Once I find this small angle, I add it to 90 degrees, I can get this bigger angle. Multiply by 2, and I have this angle. The other angle on the other side, which is what we want, will be 2 pi minus the sum of these two angles. Yeah, 360 or 360 minus this one. Uh, if you are working in degrees, if I'm working in radian, it will be 2 pi minus this. Okay? Then use the formula for arc length again, s equals to r theta. Add everything up. See, you, you have a question? What question do you have? 
Why? What square root? This one? I have to add everything out. I get this yellow one, then this one, then add this and add this one. Huh? I haven't, yeah, that will be my last step. Oh, okay. Okay? So add everything up, you'll get an answer. Oh, we are taking very long to complete this.